welcome to the Polgar Chess University. In this lesson, I'll tell you about double pawns. Double pawns is when two of the same color pawns are one on top of another. It's generally a big disadvantage because the pawn that's behind is very limited or is unable to move at all. Let's start with an endgame example. In this position, both sides have two pawns each. However, white's advantage is decisive because white has a passed pawn, while the other pawn of white's, the one on b5, is able to totally block, restrict both of the other black pawns. Let me show you how white would win in such a position. White would simply advance the passed pawn. And now black has no choice but go down as the two pawns cannot move, only the king can. White advances further, supporting the pawn to advance. And after these king moves, the pawn reaches the seventh rank. And here, the problem is that, of course, white will not make stalemate by playing king e6, but will go to c7 with the king and simply picking up black's pawns on the b file, then moving out of the way and promote the b5 pawn to a queen. For example, king captures, king captures, and after king c5, white can either push the pawn right away or first move the king out of the way, protecting the pawn, and then start pushing the pawn towards the promotion square, and the pawn is unstoppable. Let's compare this position to a very similar position, but that has a huge difference. The only difference from the previous position is that while in that position black had a pawn on b6 instead of a7, we moved that pawn to a7 here. That ends up being a tremendous difference that totally changes the outcome of the game. Here, if white tries to do the same method, advancing the pawn, and then playing king e4, the difference is that black now has a pawn that can actually advance and try to become a queen by playing a5, even though white can do en passant, black will just recapture, and of course, the game will end in a draw. White will be busy making sure the black pawn doesn't get promoted. And black will be busy holding off white's passed pawn. So for example, the game could finish by playing king d4, a5, king c5, captures, king b5, and black's pawn is lost. And therefore, the game is a draw. These last two examples just illustrated very effectively the difference between having healthy pawns side by side versus having them doubled up. Let's move on now to a middle game position. Here is our next position. And if we look carefully, we'll notice that black has an extra pawn in this position. Other than that, there is equal material, even though white has two bishops versus black's two knights. Materially speaking, at the moment, black is ahead. But it is white's turn, and that makes a major difference. But where are the double pawns, you may ask? Well, for now, they are nowhere. That's the whole point. We need to make sure that black will have them. So what's the move? Well, 
the move that achieves that goal is bishop captures knight. Generally speaking, after we castle, we always want to avoid such a trade when we need to recapture with the pawn because not only that the pawn structure becomes horrendous and much inferior than white's pawn structure on f2, g2, and h3, but in this case, even more importantly, white gets a very strong attack because the g file has opened and white already has a bishop on d3 pointing towards black's king side. In this particular case, white has an immediate win by making a very aggressive move. Try to think for a moment and figure out white's next move. Yes, it's correct. Moving the queen to h5. It's a decisive move because now both the white queen as well as bishop aim towards that h7 pawn. Of course, if the queen could capture that, that would be checkmate right away. Black has no way to protect the pawn. Blocking it by moving the f pawn would only delay the end by a move because the bishop would simply capture. And moving the rook away to e8 would still result in an immediate loss for black after checkmate with queen h8 as the white rook stops the black king from escaping. Well, what's the moral of the story? From black's perspective, try not to allow something like that because it usually doesn't end well. Of course, after bishop takes knight, if black does not recapture with the g-pawn, white would just win a knight, which is a major advantage, of course, as black. If you happen to get to such a situation, the best you can do not to capture the white bishop on f6 after bishop captures knight, but make another move and, and try to avoid further loss of material or checkmate. Let's move on to another position. And here we are. In this position, white has a small advantage because white already occupies the only open file. And also, white has a bishop while black doesn't. In normal open positions, bishops typically are a slight advantage over knights. And bishops are ideal pieces to create pins. Well, that gives away what white's next move should be. Of course, white is not quite developed. There is one more piece that needs to be developed, and that is the bishop. And it has an ideal place to go to, to g5, creating a pin over black's knight. Now this is a very important type of situation that you will face over and over throughout your chess games. How to deal with such pins is very important. If you would have a dark squared bishop as black, you would try to position it on e7. So your knight's mobility wouldn't be limited. Of course it is at this very moment, because if that knight would move from f6, black would lose the queen on d8. So what are black's choices right now to unpin his knight or to get rid of this pin altogether? Attacking the bishop by playing h6 doesn't really quite solve the problem because the bishop could maintain that pin by moving to h4. Attacking the bishop a second time is a very risky thing to do because it weakens the safety of the king on g8 and of course the bishop is not trapped. The bishop could simply move away. 
Also, in such situations, you need to consider the possibility of white sacrificing the knight on g5 and getting two pawns for the knight and developing an attack. However, the safe and solid bishop retreat to g3 definitely gives white at least a solid advantage. Let's go back to the position after the pin with the bishop on g5. How about moving the knight to e7? Now, black on the following move may move his knight out of the way, for example, to e4, because the knight on e7 is of equal value to the white bishop, and the knight on e7 is protected by the black queen. The problem now is that the queen no longer protects the knight at this moment, and therefore the bishop is able to capture the knight and again create a very unpleasant situation for black, not as bad as in our previous example, where white had an immediate mating attack, but even here the attack is quite dangerous and white here would continue by playing knight to h4, opening up the diagonal of the queen from d1, and the queen would move on the following moves, probably to h5 or g4, depending on how black continues. Again, let's go back to our starting position and go back again for a moment to the situation after bishop g5. You may wonder, but what does white threaten to do? Well, if it would be white's turn again, white would play knight to e5, because after that, black could not trade the knights well, because the white pawn would capture back on e5 using that pin. And if white would ignore that as well, then the knight could end up coming to g4, again with the idea to make sure that after a trade on f6, better knight for knight or bishop for knight, the pawn will be the one needing to recapture. Let's talk for a moment about a move like rook e8. Well, in that case, white could trade rooks. Since the knight is pinned, the only piece that can recapture is the queen, and then the bishop would capture the knight, and again, white achieved the goal of creating double pawns for black and ruining the pawn structure in front of the king. So let's go back one more time to the starting position, and what should black do after bishop g5? The best black can do here is to move out of the pin with the queen but still maintaining the option to recapture with the queen in case the bishop takes the knight. Therefore, moving the queen out of the pin to d7 would not be correct, because after bishop takes, again the pawn would end up capturing on f6. So the correct square for the queen is to move to d6, the queen is out of the pin, the knight is free, threatening to move into e4, for example, and if the bishop captures the knight, of course, the queen will be the one recaptured. A very typical situation that I bet you already have, or definitely will face at some point during your games. Let us see now a couple of examples from real tournament games. This position is played in one of the most famous historic tournaments, the Candidate Tournament in Zurich, Switzerland, in 1953. And it's a game between former world champion Vasily Smyslov against Grandmaster Stahlberg. In this position, for some strange reason, black played queen to c7 which I don't think is a very good move, but let's see how to take advantage of it. 
Well, the first thing Smyslov did, captured the knight for the bishop. But more importantly than capturing Black's bishop, to make sure he ruined the pawn structure in front of the king and to create double pawn. In a situation like this, when the opponent's king safety is gone and the g-file has been opened, usually our number one goal is to get our queen somewhere near there, near the opponent's king. And that very easily explains White's next move, which was moving the queen to e3 immediately. The goal is now to go to h6 with the queen right away. For example, after knight captures pawn, that's exactly what white would do. Move the queen to h6, not only attack the pawn on f6, but prepare a very serious attack by moving the rook up and then out and to checkmate. Let's go back to, to the game continuation after queen e3 black played king g7 preventing the queen getting to h6 and now smyslov played a very elegant move and perhaps black overlooked this move i bet black anticipated white wasting a move in protecting the pawn on c4 and then planned to activate his rook on the open g file and then hide the king in the corner and have perhaps some counterplay along the g file. But white didn't waste time in the game position and played very aggressively sacrificing his knight on e5. Oftentimes in such situations Time is the essence. Let's check first of all what happens if black accepts the sacrifice. Always that's the first thing to look at because the material advantage that one side would have could be decisive unless there is a specific proof otherwise. Now white would continue very forcefully. First a check on g5 followed by a second check on f6 and then bringing the rook to action through d3, threatening immediate checkmate with rook g3. Now, when the rook moves to e8, making space for black's king to f8, then white would simply capture the pawn on e5. Now, both white rooks are aiming to help the white queen to checkmate black's king. For example, after knight takes pawn, white would continue with check, only move king to f8, and then double up the rooks with a checkmate threat on g8, and black's position is hopeless. Black understood this and therefore did not accept the sacrificed knight. and moved the queen to e7, bringing it to defend the f6 pawn and the king side. And now white relocated the knight to g4 to help the queen to still get to that key h6 square. Black is pretty helpless against the queen getting there. For example, after king h8, the answer still would be queen h6, and after f5, knight f6, black can only avoid checkmate by giving the queen up for the knight. Again, let's go back to the game where black responded by playing rook g8. hoping that white would play queen h6. But white can do even better at this point. 
by playing knight h6. Sadly for black, this not only threatens the rook, but creates another major threat. And if the rook moves away anywhere, white can make a beautiful fork using the pin over black's pawn on e6. As now, after pawn takes knight, queen takes, and white won an exchange and has a winning endgame. In the actual game, after knight h6, black realized this deadly threat of knight f5 check and moved the queen out of the pin. And of course, white just captured the rook. And after black captured the knight, white safely protected the pawn on c4. And then in a few more moves, won the game. A simple but very instructive way of playing such and similar positions by the famous world champion Smyslov. Let's see another example where white, with a very elegant, cute combination, created double or in fact triple pawns for his opponent. White to move and gain strategical advantage. What's the move that white should play here? This is a game between two former Soviet grandmasters, Malanyuk and Andrianov, played in 1982. Well, here the move is queen takes knight, a temporary queen sacrifice, and then bishop takes queen, pawn takes back, and the goal has been achieved. Pawn captured pawn, pawn captured pawn, white played knight f to d4, and the game, of course, went on for a long time, but white's advantage is quite clear, because black has three pawns along the b file. As we can see, none of them can really move. Therefore, if you look at the other side of the board, where white has five pawns nicely connected, it really seems like white has an extra pawn on this side of the board because black has the four pawns only opposite those five. And the two on the queen side of white, the two white pawns, A and B, in fact the B alone, easily holds off all of those black pawns along the B file. So this is a typical situation of better pawn structure. Well, I'd like to show you now one of my own games that's a very good example of how to take advantage of a better pawn structure. I played this game in Spain in 1991 and I had the black pieces. At first, it looks like a rather boring position with equal material, symmetrical pawn structure. But it was my move with black, and I had the opportunity to trade my bishop for the knight. My opponent recaptured, and now it's clear that these double pawns are weak. Question is, how do I win one of them? Well, we'll see it shortly. Castle to the long side, creating some discover check threats with the knight. Therefore, my opponent moved the king out of the way. And now, I played c5, trading bishops. My opponent didn't have too much choice but trade bishops, although it may have been better in this particular case to move the bishop to f3 instead of trading it on b7. Now, if you look carefully and imagine the black knight getting to a5, 
we realize that white would have no way in protecting the pawn on c4. Of course, it takes a bit of time to get there, but at least I had a goal, and also I noticed that white has no way of attacking that a5 square because of the way the white pieces are positioned. My opponent played a natural move, putting the rook on the open file, and I went knight to f6. Creating kind of a threat of playing knight g4 next. My opponent played rook h to f1, with the idea that if I move my knight to g4 to attack the bishop and the pawn on h2, he would move his bishop back to g1. But I had something else in mind. I traded rooks on the d-file and then moved my king to c6. I'm going after that pawn on c4. That's what I was after. He played a4 and knight e4. For now, I'm planning to attack the pawn from d6. He played g4. And that makes my life a bit easier. Played h5. I wouldn't mind opening the h file at all for my rook. So my opponent pushed through, didn't want to open the h file. And knight to d6, attacking the pawn. King protected. And here we go, knight b7. I'm ready to play knight a5 check. And the pawn will be lost. It's unavoidable. Check, king c2, and knight c4. Well, the game, of course, went on for some more moves, but after winning this pawn, the rest is not very difficult. I simply followed up by playing a6 and b5 and creating a passed pawn on the queen's side and won without much difficulties. And finally, as usual, I'd like to close the lesson with something absolutely brilliant. And here it is. Black has two bishops, but yet there are some challenges. And in fact, White to move, White can save the game. It's obvious that White's only hope is the pawn on g5 that's only three squares away from promotion square. Before I show you the solution, I suggest you stop the tape, maybe set up the position on a chessboard, and try to figure out the solution yourself. And then, after spending maybe 5, 10, or 15 minutes, Come back and compare your solution with the actual solution. Well, the first move obviously has to be g6, trying to promote the pawn as soon as possible. It's clear that a black dark squared bishop cannot catch the pawn on the g7 square. Therefore, the only hope relies on the bishop on a8. So. Black's next move is forced, so now the bishop tries to go to d5, so if white would push the pawn further, bishop d5 would be the answer. And that gives away white's correct next move, king c4, preventing the bishop from coming to d5. And now black has a tricky idea. Black took the pawn on f3. So after g7, black can respond by playing c6 and then forking the new queen with bishop to d5 check. And black is winning. Right? Wrong. White can still save the game. Queen captures bishop. Pawn captures. But how can white save this game? 
Look at this. King takes pawn. Even though black is a full bishop ahead, black cannot save his pawns. White is about to capture the one on d5 and then the c pawn, keeping black's bishop busy. The king will go after the last black pawn and draw the game. But what if black protects the pawn? It's stalemate. Isn't that cute? Well, I hope you had fun, enjoy the lesson, and avoid having double pawns. Until next week, take care.